And joining us now to talk about your health is Dr. Eugenio Rocksmith, a neurologist at the University of Maryland Rehabilitation and Orthopedic Institute and associate professor of neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Doctor, it's good to have you back at MPT. Hi, thank you for having me. Our focus is traumatic brain injuries. What, what are the most common causes? We, where I work at the University of Maryland Rehab Hospital, we deal primarily with TBIs or traumatic brain injuries from car accidents, uh, often times falls, elderly patients who have falls, and unfortunately violent crimes in Baltimore City. What are the trends in terms of um, research and treatment that you've seen over your career? I would say with the, with the, with the explosion of computers and computer science and, and the internet, we see a lot of cognitive rehabilitation trends in uh, dealing with patients who have cognitive issues, who have problems with uh, performing their activities of daily living. And we can kind of simulate environments in which they are going to be in when they get back home or to wherever they're going from after they finish rehab. And they can kind of practice uh, through repetition. They can practice different activities in, a, in that type of environment. How much? Um improvement should should somebody expect? Uh, I'm sure it's improved from what it used to be, but is, is, there, is there unfortunately a ceiling? Usually I tell patients that they have about five years to make the greatest amount of recovery during, during their process, during the recovery process. But that doesn't mean that recovery stops in five years. It just means that it's gonna slow down significantly by that point. Usually patients will make the greatest amount of recovery in the first six months. And by that point, the majority of swelling inside the brain caused by whatever the brain injury uh, affected, m most of the swelling has dissipated. So what you're left with are, is actual dysfunction or damage in brain cells. And so that's when you know exactly what the severity of the brain injury is. And then through, through re repetitive PT, OT, and speech therapy, patients will continue to slowly get better. They may plateau at times uh, for a few months, a few weeks, then they'll take off again and start getting better. Then they may plateau again. Sometimes they may decline if they have an infection or if they don't sleep well at night. But the, the trend is steadily upwards in terms of recovery. What, what kinds of uh, treatment modalities do you, do you have at your disposal? I mean, is physical therapy, occupational, speech, all of those? We have those and we have uh, one area of rehab that I really enjoy is recreation therapy, and this is where a recreation therapist, somebody who, a who actually does training in recreation therapy, learns how to use what's in the environment to kind of practice what patients learn in PT, OT, and speech therapy. Like a, we have a recreation therapist at our facility who will actually take patients into grocery stores, and they'll go up and down the aisle, and they'll pick different products that are on a list, and they'll put them in the cart, and that, inc that incorporates all of the different PT, OT, and speech activities that the patients practice every day at, in the hospital, in the rehab hospital. From the, the standpoint of the patients at the rehab hospital, they're doing a lot of work, and it sounds like they, they can see improvement over time. It was the initial six months and then out to, to five years and definitely, beyond. Definitely. What, what are their biggest challenges? Probably their biggest challenge is not to give up. And we teach them that you know, the more effort you put into your recovery, we, we teach this to their families, the more effort they put into the recoveries and the more their families support them, the better their long-term outcome is going to be. And involved in that is the fact that sometimes patients will become a little depressed or become very anxious, they'll have problems sleeping, and that will affect their long-term recovery. Uh, patients will go home with, with swallowing difficulties and so they're not gonna be able to eat all the foods that they enjoy and that can contribute to, uh, to depression down the road. You, you mentioned uh, sleeping a, a couple of times. Is, that, is it common and is it more of an inpatient thing or once somebody's back home, it, it can remain no, a problem? No, continu it continues. It's especially problematic in the hospital because patients after a brain injury often have what's called reversal of their day-night day, day, sleep cycle because the hospitals are loud, they, there are lights on all the time and so patients tend to stay up during the evening or during the nighttime and then sleep during the day. So it's very difficult for us to kind of balance that with them being able to do their therapy. 
So that's something that we're always focused on treating in terms of giving them medication to help them sleep better at night. The mental health side of it, um, especially a traumatic situation, you were walking around fine one day and now you've got a, a you know, serious situation. How do you help people through that? I typically will refer them to an outpatient neuropsychologist. This is a psychologist who specializes in brain behavior relationships. And these, these psychologists will, will have re, 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 frequent counseling sessions with brain injury patients, just helping them to adapt to their, to their new bodies and to their, to their new uh, disabilities. In younger patients, in uh, children, adolescents, do they see traumatic brain injuries and, and do they come from different uh, uh, causes? I would say that typically there, there's kind of like a bimodal distribution of brain injury. Bimodal meaning there are two, two peaks. One in people who are much younger, children, adolescents, children, adolescents, and young adults and then older patients who are in their 60s, 70s, or 80s. The younger adults tend to have more frequent car accidents, uh, traumatic injuries related to, to uh, sports, and the older patients tend to have more traumatic injuries related to falls. And the, the, the type of injury, the type of pathology in the brain is a little different between the two groups. We think about um, you know, sports, you think about somebody has a concussion, the soccer field, the football field, does that itself rise to the level of traumatic brain injury. Yeah, it definitely does. There's a spectrum of traumatic brain injury ranging from mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, we call it MTBI, mild TBI, all the way out to profound, severe TBI. What are the, the strategies for, for young people, for parents, for older folks to avoid being in this situation? For parents, I would say the most important the most important thing they can do to protect their kids is, of course, whenever they're involved in any type of contact sport, to wear a helmet. Uh, sports like skiing, wear a helmet. Bike riding, wear a helmet. Uh, I just, just this weekend I was in D.C. riding around and I, I thought to myself, I feel so, I would feel so uncomfortable if I didn't have a helmet. Riding as a, as a cyclist? Riding as a cyclist, exactly. Uh, for older patients, it's very important that they, especially if they have any type of uh, mobility issue, it's very important that they have supervision at home, uh, that they use any type of adaptive equipment like a, like a walker or a cane. And because a lot of times they don't want to use that because they, oh, they feel like, oh, I'm fine, I don't need this. Like my mother has some mobility issues. And so many times I find that she doesn't want to use the cane and she's already fallen several times. So you really have to be on them to, to continue to use this adaptive equipment to prevent them from falling. How do you measure um, the brain injury? I mean, if somebody comes in, I, you know, unfortunately they're coming in from shock trauma, something, something bad has happened. Is there a way, I mean, I guess there's imaging, um, but it's not like a blood test where you, you, know, you have a score from one to 100 no, there, or something. There are blood tests that are, that are in, the, in the early infancy of, uh, of uh, use. There are a lot of research protocols, especially at downtown at the University of Maryland at Shock Trauma Hospital. Uh, there are different blood tests that, that uh, are being researched to determine if whether or not they will be helpful in, in, in trying to determine how severe the brain injury is. And then those blood tests can be repeated over time as the patient gets better. And so we don't have a, a blood test yet like cardiac enzymes. When somebody has a, a heart attack, we can't check their their, we, we can check their cardiac enzymes to know how severe the, the uh, heart attack is. We don't have that yet for brain injury, but that's coming, definitely coming. Quick question, just a, a sentence. Is there a role for medication here? Big, big role. And that's something that I really enjoy working with, with patients, especially uh, in terms of uh, patients who have behavioral issues. I use a lot of medications to help, to help kind of calm them down so that, they can, so that they can benefit from the therapy and also so that they can remain focused on the therapy. Dr. Eugenio Rocksmith, thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you. We sir. appreciate it. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.